Oh, good evening, everyone. My name is Al Kari. I'm with Matseps. Uh, Matseps is a local uh, uh, consulting and engineering company in AI and machine learning. Uh, we okay. Is this better? Uh, so I'm gonna have to say what I said again. Oh gosh, what was I saying? <laughs> Okay, so Manceps is a machine learning and artificial intelligence consultancy and engineering company. We help uh, innovative businesses bring AI into their environments. We help our customers uh, build automation solutions with AI. And uh, we are really helping some of the large enterprise, some of the medium-sized enterprises, uh, bring some of these new breed of technologies out to market. Um, we are a team of data scientists and machine learning engineers, and we're growing fast. We are starting to grow uh, uh, nationally and even globally. Uh, if AI and ML is something in your future, come and talk to us. Um, anybody here heard of TensorFlow? Oh, wow. Okay. I'm talking to the right audience. Thank you. I run the TensorFlow Northwest Meetup Group. Uh, yesterday was a repeat of the session you're seeing today at the TensorFlow Northwest. Uh, we had some fun. We had some reporters. I don't see any reporters here tonight. I also don't see any men in black, so I'm <laughs> going to speak freely. <laughs> so um, 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 I'm also a Google developer expert in machine learning, and um, that means I get access to all the latest and greatest resources from Google, so we get to help our customers deploy those. And all of our work is open source. And the unredaction of the Mueller report, as you would hear soon from uh, Hobson, is also open source. And we'd encourage all of you to get on our uh, GitHub repo, use that, uh, do whatever you feel like with it, um, make changes to it. But if you contribute it, enhancements, and if you actually have some ideas that could be useful for it, please feel free to contribute. It's your project. It's there for you to help you understand the technology. Uh, why TensorFlow, you may ask? Well, you already know Python, so you're halfway there, right? So I would encourage you to actually take a stab at, at uh, learning TensorFlow, and especially now with version 2.0, that has actually gone so much easier to use than previous versions. And if you have a little bit of uh, programming background, a little bit of mathematics, um, and uh, with the integration of the Keras tensor, uh, framework within TensorFlow, you're now able to uh, learn that very quickly, get up to speed very fast. We have a lot of examples and seed banks that would allow you to really get uh, the information you need uh, like really fast and put that to use for your customers. Uh, I'm gonna talk for like a few minutes only and then I'm gonna hand it over to Hobson to tell you about all the great research we're doing in natural language processing. Um, Basically, we'll, we'll have an introduction to NLP, and we'll talk a little bit about what unredaction is, what, uh, what, uh, what we're going to be doing to unredact that, and the process, the workflow we, we follow to actually get the text out and put it into a format that could train a model and then use that trained model to predict what the redacted sentences were. And then we'll talk about some of the latest pre-trained um, uh, text models that are available, BERT specifically, and then how you could uh, fine-tune it to do all sort of natural language processing tasks. Before we get started with technologies, I want to do this exercise with you all. So, um, oh, I can see it here. Uh, I, 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 I want us to go through this exercise real quick. Who can guess the first one? Excuse me, sir, you dropped. Thank you. Uh, I am for being late. Thank you. Uh, could we have at six and go to a movie? Dinner, thank you. Uh, my mom, some cookies if you want some. Great, thank you. <laughs> I don't understand. Could you please that? Thank you. Uh, I was born in Damascus. Where are you from? Oops. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened here? Um, we don't know what's there, but intuitively, we know what might have been in there. How did we know that? By just learning from what's before and what's after. That's something that's redacted, and us as humans, we're able to really easily just guess what's that. We drive it from the context. We understand what's in there. Uh, 
this is a short sentence that's single dimensional, we're all used to. And as the learning machines that we are, we have developed that intuition. We know that's what that should be. So, so when you take a long report, like the Mueller report, or like a long document that's redacted, uh, that's so much harder for us because that's so many, so much more multidimensional. That is so hard for us to kind of go through all these dimensions in the document and really analyze what's in all of it and try to guess those spaces, what has been redacted in that. Well, guess what? For computers and for machine learning, learning applications, that's where their strengths are, multidimensional problems. That multidimensionality allows you to actually analyze that very quickly and come back with um, predictions as to what was in there. In some cases, we predicted some names that did not exist in the report altogether. And you'll see that uh, demo, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, but we'll also demo a couple of these uh, with a, our predictor, and you will see if it's actually going to guess these things right like you guys did. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to introduce Hobson Lane, who flew from California to do this today. And um, uh, you, all, you all enjoy the talk. Thank you, Al. That, um, Al's been extremely generous to even fund this research. and. Um, this, this fun project for me, it's been really, really, really exciting. I really appreciate that. And, and he, like you said, he's, he's growing a, a really innovative company, a company that's very much focused on the pro-social aspects of natural language processing, image processing, all the aspects of AI. And, um, and that's the, the theme of this book. If um, for the, the lucky winner today who can do this game on Mueller, the Mueller report um, better than the, the model that we have here called BERT. So um, that'll be your challenge. So, so keep your uh, keep your your skills up. Thanks for that. that was a really good introduction. Because those examples are exactly what a natural language model is. Um, uh, they they are trained on exactly this kind of data. They're given a sentence and asked to fill it in the blanks. So these are intentionally redacted, and then we know what the answer should be. Um, you can take any corpus and, and create this semi-supervised learning pipeline to train a model to understand language. It's called a language model, but it's much more than that. Um, it's, it's used for predictive text, obviously, on your phone when you're trying to uh, key in with your thumbs some long word. It, it knows exactly what you're about to type uh, based on the, these sort of language models. Um, the middle button game, autocomplete. Um, Time series models, you might not re recognize this, but any sequence um, can, be, can benefit from the, the tools that are here in language models. It's just a sequence model. And um, in addition, these, um, it's, it's learning more than just words. Um, it, it's not just filling in those with the, it's, it's learning the actual physics of the world. It knows that a wallet can be dropped. It knows that, um, uh, I is um, it, when someone's talking to someone else and says the word I, that means they must be talking to someone else who would say you. So if you, if you train it on enough and a broad enough corpus as Google has done with BERT on Google News and uh, all of these statements about physics in the real world and the logic of the real world, the, the machine will actually learn much more than the words. It will actually have a brain that can reason about the world. And, that, and so there's, um, this is what one of the big innovations that came through with BERT, the, the, language, the, the model that I'm going to show you. It's, um, it's capable of, being, of, of accomplishing many tasks other than just predictive text. It can, for instance, answer questions. Questions, and this is, um, there's a, there's a, that was the, the mind-blowing experience, not only for, uh, for us, but also for Google themselves. They had no idea that it would be able to do this as well as it did. It did it better than humans. It was able to answer simple questions, the kinds of questions you would have on an elementary school quiz or test, 2% better, 2% greater accuracy, above 90% accuracy on the squad um, uh, benchmark uh, question and answer data set. So that tells you that it must know something about the world if it can answer questions about the world. It has facts in its, in its brain. So um, along the lines of that human um, learning, uh, uh, you, you can think of, if, if you've never built a natural language, who's, who's built a natural language processing pipeline before for a model like this? Only Al? Come on. Okay, well, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ease you into it and, and, and some things that you probably have done that you don't know about. You have created a model um, in your own mind, your own neural net, for things like uh, rain and sun prediction. Those are discrete event predictions. So as you're riding your bike across Hawthorne Bridge, you're, uh, you're trying to predict whether the next day is going to have rain or, or, or sun, and you're using a, a history of all the, the rain or sun events that you've seen in the previous days all the previous mornings you've crossed that bridge. You're also doing the same thing for whether it's going to be up or down, whether it's going to be cloudy, whether it's going to be, whether it's going to be traffic, whether it's going to be roses that are in bloom. You're, you're constantly doing this in your own neural network. And so that's all the machine is doing. But instead of these physical events coming in as discrete items, you're, you're bringing in words. And that's all we're doing with this neural net. Um, uh, Californians learn too. Uh, we learn more about the smog uh, level. and. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we do email inbox. We were worried about how many, um, how many emails we've gotten from our boss and other, and other people. Um, we're uh, worried more about web traffic and stock price than bicycle traffic um, and um, traffic jams on the freeway and how the Dodgers are doing. But um, machines learn in a very similar way. Um, in fact, the, these models uh, are, of course, trained on a sequence of historical data. And, um, who has built a me, uh, who's built any other kind of machine learning model, any kind of data science model? Come on, excellent, about half. So we'll, we won't spend too much time here. But um, who thinks they have uh, built an MLE model, a maximum likelihood estimator model? The hint's right up here. You probably have, you don't know it. Um, whenever you do an average, that, that averaging you're doing, that rolling average you're doing on the, the, the weather in your head, that's actually a, that's a maximum likelihood estimator. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a really, um, it's, that's the one of the most basic uh, uh, data science models you can build. Um, what about a linear regression? Who's built a linear regression? Yeah, okay. So many people have done that in college. Um, uh, moving average or um, who's, who's built, who's ever heard of an ARMA model, autoregressive moving average? Okay, uh, I'll give you a hint. Um, well, regressive, um, it's, uh, it's very similar to the recursive model I'm going to show in, in the future and, 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 and the subsequent slides here. But um, basically, it's just building on the, the past experience, but only holding in your brain a single um, memory of yesterday's estimate of the likelihood of rain, for instance. So as you're crossing the bridge, you had, you had some estimate, oh, it's, it's going to probably rain tomorrow. And you just remember that, and then the next day as you observe it, you just average what actually happened with that prediction and keep moving forward. That's all an ARMA model is. It's used with much success in, um, in the financial markets for predicting the stock price uh, and future stock prices. Obviously, they, they expand it from just yesterday's price to many days in the, in the past. But that's, um, that's a very, what that does is it gradually regresses to the, um, to the mean that you want it to be at for the prediction for the future. Um, the uh, a decision tree, um, who's, well, obviously, I, I, won't, I won't belabor you if you keep asking you whether you've built these things or not. A decision tree is another formal model that you often use in everyday life. Um, uh, if, if, if the temperature is higher than 70 degrees, I take off my jacket, um, those sorts of, um, or, um, uh, and so these, these decision trees can also be built by computers statistically from the data. Um, and if you combine a bunch of them together, um, those, the, that group of decision trees becomes a forest. Uh, and mostly, uh, you've probably heard of random forest as another model that combines a bunch of decision trees that have been trained on various uh, parts of the data. And then if you do boosting for those that are, um, that are more accurate than the, than the others, and you combine them all together, that's called XGBoost. And that's one of the most powerful models out there right now. If you want to win a Kaggle competition and it involves uh, um, any kind of data set that lends itself well to decision tree sort of uh, reasoning, um, you'd be uh, very, very uh, smart to, you, to start with an XG boost. Um, they, they'll, they'll get you there very fast. So what about natural language? What about chat bots? What are they learning? And how does this work out for them? Uh, what kind of data is coming in to train them? Well, as Al pointed out, it's words. Uh, actually, it's tokens. It doesn't necessarily have to be a word. In fact, the, the model we're going to show you that can generate um, text very similar to Muller's style is, the, um, is a character-based model. So you can spend it, your tokens can be all the way down to the character level. Um, or it can be entire words. Um, it can be two grams. It could be um, uh, Robert Muller uh, instead of just, uh, uh, just the name Muller. It, because 
in many cases, words go together in pairs or triplets. And so those are called n-grams, and you can, you can make those your tokens if you like. Um, obviously, emoticons and, um, and abbreviations and even punctuation, those are all considered tokens in your, in your model. And you'll see um, how that's used as we flow that data into the, um, to the, uh, these natural language models. This is how that works. So your first step is to break your, uh, your data into tokens. In our case, our data is not yet numbers, so we've got to create numbers out of it. And so the way we do that is we uh, create, uh, we have a machine. Um, these are, this is machine learning. So uh, the, 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 uh, very, if, if you're as old as I am, you probably interacted with um, a, a coin sorter like this when you had a bunch of change and tokens that came back from, maybe you got, got back from the arcade as a kid. Um, and you wanted to make sure you had the, the right ones for the right arcade in the right, in the right box, in your toy box, well, um, you'd use a little thing like this to, uh, to get them all sorted out. Well, that's going to then create at the bottom a bunch of uh, stacks of all your coins that you can wrap paper around if you want to make paper rolls or you want um, of, of them. Or in, in, in our case, it, you're gonna just going to count up how many of those words are in each of the bins. And, of course, we have many more tokens than just the five or six possible denominations of coin. You have, um, you have all the words in the English language, plus all the words that have never been in the English language that people make up or misspell or create on their own on the fly when they're thumb typing. So, um, so uh, your, your, your histogram is much broader. The machine is much broader, but mach machines can, uh, you know, can handle very easily vocabularies above two, two or, um, or more million uh, tokens. That's, um, uh, I got that, that two million number comes from word to vec. That's the, that's the vocabulary size that Google decided to, uh, to focus in on when it was reading an entire web and, and trying to create an embedding of words. Uh, an embedding, well, I'll talk about a little bit more about that later. Um, so the, now you've got your words. Those words are now coming into, and we're going to talk about deep learning today rather than some of these other models, these uh, uh, regressions and, uh, uh, and uh, decision trees. We're going to talk about... Um, Regressions of a different sort, cascaded regressions. So these, each you can think of each one of these layers as a linear regression. If you remember in school, when you're doing a linear regression, you're just trying to find the slope of that line and how high up or down it is to fit through your data. Well, that's all, the, each one of these is one of those. It's trying to figure out, okay, I've got this signal coming in, and each time it comes in, um, uh, it's uh, the output that I, that I have on the outside that I know what the answer is, it's, it's at this level. So I have my X and my Y, and I'm trying to draw a line between them to try to see some relationship between those inputs and outputs. Well, that looks very simple when you have a single layer and you can do your normal uh, solutions to figure out what that slope should be. But when you have two layers, it becomes impossible to do it in closed form. You have to do it iteratively because you don't know how, how that answer is going to propagate back through all the layers and get to that point. You don't know how much to change the slope for that one particular neuron based on the answer changing at the other end. That's, uh, that's called back propagation. And that's the thing, that's the, the innovation, the, the way of doing that was a big discovery um, very recently um, where they were able to overcome some of the challenges of this. Um, you may hear in literature things like vanishing gradients or exploding gradients. The gradients are this, that slope we're trying to fit to. Um, and they will, as, you, as you're going back through all these multiplications by these slopes of the, of the other neurons, trying to find your way back to the one you're trying to change, um, that gradient can disappear or it can explode, depending on if those numbers are too big or too small. And so they came up with a way, I think about 10 years ago, that, uh, that really um, made neural networks uh, come into their own um, on image recognition and natural language processing tasks where they are, uh, are so useful. Um, one last note about neural networks and, and deep learning. One of the, 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 the reason why they are what everyone is using now on everything is because they're a black box. They no longer require the skill of a, a data scientist to um, extract information from that image or that text. It's no longer up to me um, to figure out which words are important in this document and what and how I can mathematically massage the statistics about those words in order to create a lower dimensional representation of the meaning of that document, like grouping together proper names, uh, identifying nouns and verbs, all that stuff we used to do as natural, in natural language processing only 10 years ago, that's all out the window. We don't have to do it anymore. 
the machines can now do it better than us because we've, we've, we found out that these, these early layers are doing all that feature extraction for us automatically without us doing any thinking about it. So um, we're, we're learning from the machines now. We're learning what's important to the actual problem that we're training it on. Uh, we're, they're telling us that, yes, um, the word uh, Viagra is very important to this, uh, to this document, but only when it's associated, when it's not associated with something like a uh, prescription or a doctor's name. It's learning which words and which combinations of words are good at predicting whatever that output is, that classification that we're trying to do on our spam and our inbox or whatever it is. Whatever task we set it up to do, it figures out what it needs to, to pay attention to in those, um, in those words. Uh, likewise for images. You can imagine how hard it would be for images to figure out what's important about an image to say that it's a cat or a dog. And that's the, that's the big example that caught everybody's attention, the, the cats or, cat or dog um, recognition algorithm by, um, uh, by Google uh, for deep learning. So uh, what's NLP good for? It's, it's good for a lot of things, and it's good for the world. Uh, one of the main things I want you to get out of this talk uh, today is not so much how powerful it is and all the wonderful things you can do, like uh, attempting to underdact uh, the Mueller report, but um, it can also, um, it's, it's used by a lot of other people for less uh, good things, uh, less pro-social things. Um, it's being used by Google to manipulate you. It's being used by Facebook to manipulate you. It's being used by, um, uh, the, um, uh, by Putin to manipulate you. So it's being used by everyone to manipulate you. And it's up to you to build those tools that are both going to protect you from that manipulation and to assist you so you can compete with those large corporations and those government organizations that are trying to affect you. You're going to have to start learning from the machines, and you're going to have to start using their intelligence to augment your intelligence if you want to have a chance in this fight against uh, all the others out there who are trying to manipulate you. So um, that's what this book is all about. Um, it's my Bible, not because it's such a great reference. There are, there are much better references if you want to know the nuts and bolts of natural language. But it is a really good overview of all the things you can do with it. And I preach in, er in almost every chapter about how you can use it to do something good in the world, um, how you can do it, something pro-social with it. So um, uh, whoever can uh, can 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 help can unredact the Mueller report as, as good as Burt can, um, you'll get a chance to, to, to get the opportunity to listen to that preaching. Um, the, uh, uh, oh, another thing about the book while I'm on it, um, Hannes and, and Cole, they are the responsible for all of the material on deep learning. I didn't know anything about deep learning when I came into this uh, three years ago to start writing this book. I knew I wanted to write about natural language. I knew a lot about it, but I had, was not up to speed on the latest and greatest techniques. They were, and they were super excited to help me out and, uh, and write those chapters. And now I'm, I'm as, uh, up to speed with them, but um, I, I spent all I did on those chapters was try to dumb them down. So they're responsible for the smart ideas, ideas in there, and I'm responsible for having dumbed them down enough so that anyone can, can comprehend them. We're putting things like that diagram of the, the coin sorter in there. So that's, uh, that's, that's, so a uh, big thanks to them as well for, um, for all they've done for the, this book and this cause. Um, it, can, it can also be used for things uh, less pro-social than, um, than trying to identify fake news. It can be used to generate fake news. It can be used to generate um, uh, weather and finance reports. Um, uh, I don't know if you know this, but most of the time when you're listening to a radio forecast by NOAA, that's uh, machine generated. Likewise, for finance reports, if you're, if you're wondering why it always sounds kind of vanilla and kind of the same, how there was buying yesterday, but there was selling over there, um, it's, all, it's getting all those information and all those words from a natural language processing generation pipeline. Um, the, uh, many of those reports are machine generated. Um, search and extractive summary. This will be the one that you're probably most familiar with. When you type something into Google search bar, or if, as I would much prefer if you type it into DuckDuckGo, you'll see that, um, that they are doing a lot of natural language processing to figure out what the, the meaning of those words are. You'll find that, um, that you, can search, you can search for something and it won't, none of the words that you actually put in there might be, there might be none of the words you ask for in the document that comes up first. That's an example of natural language processing's power. It can actually understand your intent. 
understand the semantics, the meaning of what you just typed in in your query box. Likewise, it's doing the same on the documents. Um, that's sometimes more likely to happen on Google than it is on DuckDuckGo because DuckDuckGo is actually trying to help you find the right document. Google's trying to sell you something. So, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, now of course, DuckDuckGo has to make money too. They do uh, push advertisements as well, but they don't track you. They give you vanilla search results for all human beings on the planet. They don't say, um, oh, you're a black man from South Central LA, so I'm gonna advertise to you in this particular way. Um, they don't keep track of your history. Uh, DuckDuckGo um, forgets everything after you leave their site. So, um, so you, you can be sure that you're outside of the bubble whenever you do a search on DuckDuckGo. So another plug for uh, a pro-social company. Um, so law, you'd be surprised that you can actually use natural language. There are chatbots now in New York City and, and London. Uh, where um, you can um, provide them with a parking ticket and the chat bot will then petition to have it um, uh, expunged from your record and, um, and have it um, eliminated from your, your um, and it will participate in a dialogue with the, the judges and lawyers on the opposite side trying to, trying to collect those, those, uh, those fees from you. And, uh, and, and mo I think there was some phenomenal millions of dollars that was saved by drivers in New York City and likewise in London using this chat bot um, without any labor by, by human beings. Uh, really amazing use of, of law, uh, of, of natural language uh, for law, um, natural language processing for law. Uh, novels and movie scripts. There was a movie that came out just two years ago, um, back before even BERT was invented, which is a much more powerful model. Uh, a whole movie script, and it was, it was produced and turned into an actual movie. It wasn't great; it was actually pretty horrible. But it was, um, but it was entirely generated by a natural language processing um, algorithm pipeline. And likewise, you can write books. Uh, we generated some of the sentences in, uh, in natural language processing in action uh, using uh, uh, natural language processing. We didn't have the entire manuscript in hand in order to train that uh, generator on, so um, we were only able to do extractive summarization. But um, uh, extractive summarization is, is like search. When you're looking for the most relevant sentence in a, in a document that, to describe that, um, that document. So that's a, called extractive summarization. Um, that's one of the techniques we're using at Manceps for one of our uh, uh, customers. Um, uh, the, the, the one we're moving towards in the future will be abstractive summarization. In that case, you can take uh, text and generate completely new descriptions of a document, new summaries of a document, um, uh, completely new text. In the same way that they're, uh, that they're generating these, these novels and movie scripts, you can use those same techniques to generate a new sentences much better than that single sentence that the author thought of to summarize his book. So um, that's, uh, that's a pretty powerful use of, of natural language processing. And IA, I'm a big fan of IA, not so much about AI. Uh, IA is intelligence augmentation. Intelligence augmentation is, um, is when you use artificial intelligence to make you smarter as an individual, um, not to um, automate, automate away your job, not to take your place, but to help you do your job better, uh, get rid of the boring parts of your job, and, and you can do what you do best. That's interact with other human beings, be creative, uh, see patterns across data sets that um, have not been included in the and your assistant's brain, uh, that's where your, uh, your skills come into play. And if you can augment that with a machine, um, then you're a Superman. And if you think I'm exaggerating uh, about uh, being a Superman, I mean, there, there are books written on how super intelligence is going to change us all, whether we like it or not. Um, the uh, RNN. Uh, so now we're getting into the, the nuts and bolts of these models. Um, an RNN is the. Um, is a recurrent neural network. Um, who can give me a definition, and those that were here last night are not allowed to answer, who can give me a definition of recurrence? Any definition. What do you think recurrence means? Okay, I'll, I'll make it a little easier on you. That's pretty close. That's pretty close to the one I'm thinking of, actually. Um, I'll give you a hint. The definition that I saw that a computer scientist pointed out to me um, and his textbook has only two words in it. You think what those might be? Anybody, who knows what recurrence means? Oh, that's the problem. Okay, I, I understand. Oh, you know what it means. <laughs> Very close. 
The words are C, recurrence. In other words, go back to your dictionary, look at the de definition for recurrence again, and that tells you everything you need to know about recurrence. Recurrence means feeding your output back into your input. That's all, that's all recurrence means. And you can see it here in this diagram. Within an LSTM, this is a, a, a version of an LSTM called a GRU, a gated recurrent unit, because of the, of the nature of this particular um, unit that is, is used in the recurrence. It's got a gate on it. Um, all LSTMs do have gates. Uh, it's just that a GRU only has three of them, or maybe even only two of them, but, I, but it has one less than an LSTM model, so it makes it a lot more efficient. Um, the, the recurrence is happening on, as, as these letters are coming in, or tokens are coming in, uh, they, they occupy a particular location in this vector with a zero or a one saying, yes, I'm here, no, I'm not here. And the, when that comes in, you multiply it by some gain, some slope uh, that on that linear regression we were talking about. Um, I'm sorry, that, this is the actual value that, uh, that you have associated with A. This can be a, ve a continuous vector, it doesn't have to be a, um, a, a discrete vector. Um, and then you multiply it by your gain. In this case, we have two uh, as the current weight at that particular neuron in this LSTM. And then, it, um, and so it outputs this 1.2, but then that's fed back through this gate, um, which uh, also has a weight associated with it, um, where you can multiply by that. So that uh, divides it by four, gets it down to 0.3. And now you've got this other value that's coming in. Here's where the diagramming gets tough. Which one's going in? Is it 0.6 or 0.3? And how many of these am I going to go th cycles? Am I going to go through? And where is this going to end up? Where, what's the what's the settling point for this uh, particular uh, recurrence? And in addition, there are th two other gates doing very similar things and sending more information back in. One of them is called the forgetting gate, so then, and the other one is called the attention gate. So these are these are gates that are trying to decide whether this letter or whether this word is important and whether I can forget about it and, and not worry about it in the future. And all those weights are interacting with each other and are being affected by the training data and changing in such a way. And so the way it's typically diagrammed is this way. And so once you have that recurrence happen, once it's gone through one loop, the next letter that's coming in, you're, you're seeing that, you're seeing the, the, it propagate forward that weight instead of um, being in the going through the same box, so that 2.0 would be here, 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 and here as it as it propagated through your your sentence or your uh, your characters, your tokens. So that's how that's the the general layout of the math and a um, and a recurrent uh, neural network. I'm going to go back to one this diagram here. Um, I just want to point out that this has been uh, simplified um, greatly. Uh, so that you don't have to keep track of all these individual multiplications and divides as individual operations. These, as you can see in this fully connected network, are matrices. These, this can just be a, a, two, uh, a, a table of numbers that you multiply by this. In this case, this would be a four by five matrix. So there would be 20 numbers that would be 20 weights that would then be multiplied by the input. So you take the this four by five matrix, multiply it by that four one, then you take this uh, six by five matrix and multiply it by that, uh, that five element matrix, and you just do those matrix multiplications. Has anybody heard um, why we've put it in this format, why we do it this way, why we try to do matrix operations rather than trying to do individual uh, floating point operations on your machine and use other functions besides just multiply and add? Why do we do it? Why do we simplify it down to this, this level? Besides, obviously, making it easier to, to write out the formula for, so we can write a big letter A or W for those weights. Why do we do that? Where, where's this computation happening, Lawrence? You got it. Um, Lawrence, by the way, is, um, has put together a Bernie bot uh, that, um, that can generate text using natural language processing uh, very similar to Bernie's uh, missives. Um, it's a, it's, and I'm going to ultimately take this Muller redaction uh, code and put it into that bot so that you can put into, you can tell Bernie that you want to unredact a sentence and he will do it for you. So that's, that's what I'm hope, that, I hope, if you want to help me out, it's, it's very going to be very straightforward. I'm going to do a demonstration of, of how, of that, of the current UX, which is just on the command line. And all we want to do is just put that on the web in a very simple Flask app. Who, who builds Flask apps? Uh, in a Python user group, come on. Awesome, we've got a few. Awesome, you can help us out on that. I'd appreciate it. Uh, where are we? So, so yes, matrix operations because they work well in um, in the 
and there we go. So yeah, they, because they work well on a GPU. Who, what's a GPU? Yes, what's a graphics processing unit? Video card, there we go. Now we're getting closer. Uh, any gamers in here? Uh, AMD used to, um, they, they couldn't compete. Uh, uh, NVIDIA created a monopoly by, by being smart about open sourcing their CUDA library. I'm not actually open sourcing it, but uh, making it better. Um, their, their CUDA library is what's driving it. Yeah, that's a custom, that's a custom architecture that they have. Uh, they're trying to get you locked into their uh, particular approach. They're also trying to make it efficient in a different way. Uh, let's see. What was it? I mean, we're going to bring up the. Uh, uh, so, Manceps and um, Alcar has uh, put together this awesome uh, collaboratory notebook on uh, on unredacting the, the Mole report, but he's doing it using this LSTM model. The LSTM model is the precursor to the model that I'm going to show you towards the end. That's the more advanced model. It's uh, it involves um, so. Um, so um, in this Mueller report that's in the uh, in the repo that uh, 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 TFW on Manceps on GitHub, there's uh, there's a copy of this the Mueller report uh, uh, unredacted uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, in there, you can see we've downloaded the Mueller text. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Mueller report was released in an illegal way. It was printed, hand carried to Barr, and Barr then scanned it um, as images. It did not even produce text when he uploaded it to the web. Um, people complained. Three days later, he uploaded an OCR version of it. As you can see in some of these examples out of it, um, Barr, uh, the chose to use a particular OCR system that was so poor that even the, the very first line, whenever there's these, um, these lines of uh, any kind of obscuration of, of text, um, it uh, completely um, gets it wrong. It, it, just, it basically spit out garbage. That was, uh, un, but um, we were able to, uh, to use OCR um, through Google Cloud Vision and other resources that uh, were able to correct that. And um, others have done the same. So this is actually built. If you look at the repo on GitHub, I'll list all the other people who are working on this uh, to get that report in machine readable form and useful for things for projects like this. So that I uh, owe a great debt of gratitude to to them for making this possible. Um, so this is the sort of thing that um, you you get out of there uh, as as you're counting up all the. If you want to, if you want to tokenize into characters, whether you've done here, these are the sorts of characters that are coming out. Obviously, a lot of punctuation at the beginning of your uh, vocabulary. Um, and then you're gonna, uh, so this is what uh, a statement might look like um, as you as you map uh, the report on the investigation, that statement would then map to these numbers, which are positions in a vector that are becoming, uh, a, so each one of these becomes a vector, what's called a one hot encoded vector with a single one in it, all the rest zeros at, at location 50 for the case in the case of R in our vocabulary for this particular uh, statement. And so that vocabulary stays constant throughout all your documents. And so you're required to, to process all your documents, do that tokenization, create that vocabulary, do that vectorization, and then you can go back through it and use those vectors to do learning on it. So that's what this LSTM model is doing. Um, uh, so here we have um, uh, I'm actually not sure Alec can fill me in here. He he did this demo yesterday, and I'm just going to rush through the, the. Here's the part there we were talking about just a moment ago, where the. Um, where this is the sort of thing you're getting out of the OCR that um, uh, that Barr provided to us all um, as citizens of of this government, um, he decided that we 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 could get by just fine with that kind of text. Uh,
Wouldn't you, if, if, the, if your boss, the President of the United States, had ordered you to resist all attempts to, um, for Congress to get any information from you? That... <laughs> Perhaps. Or, or you just use, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so um, so this is a, a statement that has, is a little bit more. Um, actually, no, it's not. This is that dirty statement again. Uh, so, but but the way we're doing this, uh, you, as you can see, the 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 model is trying to predict uh, the future after you. So it's trying to say what's what's going to follow you. And so uh, the input uh, data might be you, and then the target data. This is what we're telling it to to generate from the LSTM model after it's done. Will be the rest of the sentence. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go through this sentence. Um, so we get, we get thousands of examples, or hundreds of examples out of each sentence of 100 characters um, simply by rotating through the target point um, in that uh, document or in that uh, particular line of text. So that you, you, can, you can create your own training set. You're labeling it yourself. The machine can automatically figure out what it needs to learn from. So this is how you label it. So your inputs and your outputs of these networks. So on the left hand side, you would have the U. On the right-hand side, you would have a sequence that went on for the rest of the sentence, and then and then you'd have the next the next input in your next example that it has to learn from. It would have a U and a dot, and then say, and then the rest would be S dot and the rest of the sentence. Those would be that would be two examples, and obviously you can get many more out of it. And it could learn each time it's it's doing that back propagation and figuring out what are the weights that are going to give me the right answer. What are the weights that are going to give me the right answer? Another interesting thing to note is the input and the output are of different length. An RNN doesn't care. Recurrence doesn't care. It just keeps doing that recurrence until the end of sentence or end of document or end of statement character comes up. You have to insert those in so it knows when to end, but those are part of your training data. So it knows that that's, that you is not a complete sentence. It knows it's going to probably have to generate a lot of characters. So whatever character normally follows you, it will generate that and then generate the one after that and the one after that until it reaches that end of sentence character. That's how uh, natural language generation works on our current neural network. Um, uh, next, so the um, uh, this is just showing uh, the nuts and bolts of how that's happening uh, in, in going through that, that uh, simple uh, sentence. And I'm gonna start the training here shortly. Uh, so th this is giving you your vocab um, size, uh, building up. Now, you can see that this is a very simple model. Um, we're going to build a, in Keras. Who's used Keras before? It's, it's a wonderful high-level language to wrap around um, a TensorFlow. It allows you to, to put uh, very simple statements. Like sequential is just a fully connected, not a fully connected word. It's just a, a set of layers. That's all that means. It doesn't mean sequential data. It doesn't mean anything other than, yes, I'm going to have many layers. I'm going to do one uh, processing after the other. That's all that means. Uh, then the next word that might be interesting to you is um, the, uh, this embedding. So there's, uh, there's various ways to do embedding. The one we're doing uh, is uh, this LSTM embedding. So that's uh, that's the next. So that's those are the only two elements that are required. This is a single layer LSTM. Oh, actually, does anybody know what LS and TM stand for? I said what RNN was. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Um, these RNNs, uh, as they're going through this uh, this process, and they're they're gradually. Yes. Good job. Yes, they uh, because the recurrence have a pro recurrent neural networks have a problem with uh, forgetting about the past very quickly, and so long-term, short-term memory uh, uh, networks can remember. Uh, basically, they don't start forgetting until about a hundred tokens. So that's just about enough to get through a sentence in the Mueller report. So uh, so that's uh, that's that's where the, the innovation that LSTMs came through, and that that's what those gates are for. They're trying to figure out what I need to remember, what I need to forget, what I need to pay attention to. So that's uh, that's how you set it up in um, in Keras. And then uh, it's smaller again, so you can see what's going on. Uh, it must be training. Uh, 
All right. Uh, so I won't, I won't bore you with the, the random predictions, but when you, before you initialize the model, before you actually do any training, it's just going to randomly guess uh, what the next characters are. And then once you start the training, you'll be able to see that the, the loss will start to come down. The error between, the difference between what it's predicting, we've got to compile the model. Uh, in Keras, anybody's familiar with Keras, you'll have to do that. Then the last step will be to, um, so we, get, we create a checkpoint callback so that every time that we, um, every time we go through one of the, every time we go through our document of all those characters, it'll save the, um, oops. Whew. Okay, so now it's off. Um, this will take a while. Uh, Actually, I did not choose a, um, I didn't choose a, a GPU, but it seems to be going okay. Uh, the, uh, it, it's, uh, it's going through the document um, all, and using that data to, to adjust all those weights. It's going through each epic and, and is going through the entire document. Um, it's going through it in batches. Uh, it's broken into 200 batches uh, for, uh, for those documents. Uh, those are just groups of examples of those characters sets. You can see that the loss, which is a measure of the error, is coming down. It uh, cut by half, basically, in the first epic. Um, and then again, um, and, uh, and you can see that their the improvement uh, is getting less, it's getting less and less fast at getting better um, as it goes through the training set. I won't, I won't wait around for it to finish. Um, we will, I will instead move on to the rest of the slides and we'll come back to that later and show you what the results are and how it can generate this a long sequence of characters when you just give it a short little prelude of what you're trying to predict. Uh, where are my slides? So, which one is Bert? Someone said right. How many votes for right? How many votes for left? How many votes for right? How many votes for left? Okay, your right or is right. Uh, your Bert's on the on the right. Ernie's on the left. Um, and it's not Elmo. Elmo is yet another uh, Muppet that is also named for, uh, or a neural network was named for him. Elmo is another natural language model that's uh, not quite as good as Bert. So we're going to stick with Bert for today. Uh, BERT stands for Bidirectional Encoding, Encoder Representation from Transformers. Uh, it's not just a Muppet name. Um, the um, bidirectional, this is the key. So that model I just showed you was predicting the future. It was saying, if you see the U, what's coming after U? Well, it's probably S. Uh, and, and if you've been reading the Mueller report, because there's U.S. all over the place in there. But if... Um, but a bidirectional encoder can read the end of the sentence and try to predict the stuff towards the middle. So it's much more like those examples that Al showed you at the very beginning. Uh, those examples where you redact some part of the middle of the sentence, it's learning to predict from both sides. None of the other models did that. Um, everybody else thought that the proper way to read documents, to read text, was to always read uh, left to right. So the, the, the other model is GPT-2. Has anybody heard of GPT-2? GPT-2 was the first model to actually, um, to to take up Google's lead on this and start going bidirectional. Before that, OpenAI had built GPT. Uh, GPT-2, just so you know, uh, was uh, deemed too dangerous to release by OpenAI because it was so good at imitating human conversation. Um, it could be used to uh, create, um, obviously, uh, fake news and interact with people in ways that would um, confuse them as to who they were interacting with. So they, uh, they chose not to release it. I'm not sure that that's going to help because um, it's just a matter of time before somebody else does. And, uh, and they did release the full architecture. Um, so it's, it's, it'd be quite easy to reverse it. Not easy. It would be possible to reverse engineer it if you had the data set that it was trained on. Um, but um, nonetheless, uh, BERT is completely open. Uh, they have released two versions of it, the big version and the small version, the 12 layer and the 24 layer. And um, uh, the... Um, Or we talk about intelligence organization. Okay, great. Now we're now to the fun part. So now we're going to actually use BERT. I see some people getting up to leave, so I'll try to uh, wrap it up with uh, some examples. So 
uh, what I've done here is I've got a, a terminal program where I've, I've loaded BERT um, just so you see what its architecture looks like. It's uh, 12 layers, um, 12 uh, what's called transformer layers. That's what the big innovation that uh, uh, BERT came up with or, or Google came up with for this model. Let's use transformers in place of um, GRUs. Transformers are very similar to um, uh, data recurrent units, uh, GRUs. Only difference is they've simplified it in such a way that it can be uh, shoehorned into this uh, matrix operation uh, sort of framework so that it can train a lot faster. And, um, and it also makes it parallelizable. So in the case of that GRU, you had to train it character by character on your sentence, uh, whereas on, with, the, um, with this new approach with matrix multiplications, it, it's possible to do it uh, each character and each word or each token separately on a separate process. So you can parallelize it massively. And that's what Google did when they trained it on Google News and the massive corpus of text that they have. And so it has a total of 100 million uh, uh, trainable parameters, so it would normally take a long, long time. Uh, this, is a, a, this is a number you want to uh, pay attention to. I don't know, you probably can't even see it. Uh, 100, 000, 100 million um, is, the, uh, is the total number of tra trainable parameters. If you go to 12 la uh, 24 layers, of course, that doubles, I think, at least. Uh, so it's probably at 200 million. That's uh, the number of weights that it has to adjust each time it's back propagating. Um, it's uh, also um, a measure of the information capacity of the network. So it tells you how smart the brain is ever going to be. It's, a, it's, a, it's the number of neurons in the brain, essentially. Uh, not neurons, but actually synapses, the number of connections. So you can, uh, to compare this to the human brain, uh, human brain, I think, is 8 billion or 80 billion uh, neurons. And, that, and so that, and you multiply that by a branching factor of 10, you're talking 800 billion, uh, many, many more than this little BERT model can have. But now, Give me, one, give me some text that you would like to redact and before I paste in some molar text. So um, uh, let's see. Actually, I'll, I'll use the, the one that, um, that Al gave us. So um, did I copy and paste that? I'll, uh, I'll just type it in here. Uh, excuse me, sir. You unknown word, your wallet. So I, I, I default, if anybody wants to use this, if they actually clone the repo and not start to use it themselves, just so you know, I, the default uh, marker for an unknown word is onk. I, I think it's probably not a word in the English language, so I'm hoping that it would. Have, it's going to take a while for it to, uh, to load up for the first time. And there it goes. Um, instead of saying dropped, it says forgot. Uh, so uh, this, this model and its, and its wi wiseness of reading Google News thinks that it's much more likely that this person forgot their wallet, uh, left it on a table or whatever, rather than dropped it. People don't drop their wallet as much as they forget it, apparently. Or perhaps forgot is a more general concept, since it doesn't have a whole lot of information about this sentence. It has to be quite general, and so it doesn't want to uh, be too specific. And so that's another way of thinking about it. It's going to always give you the average response of a human being. It's, it's going to be an average response of everybody who's ever written anything in Google News. So that's basically what the kind of brain it's going to have. So now let's try it on. Um, uh, oops. Not sure why that happened. So um, let's try another one. Let's let's take uh, something from the Mueller report. Uh, let's see if I've put the onks in here properly. Oh, that's I haven't yet. Oh, that's right. Uh, there he goes. Yep. So uh, there's unk unk before Roger Stone. Okay. Th th unfortunately, this is the uh, the punchline. So if you get this one right, you're pretty good. Anybody have any guesses for what this name is? That's between uh, Michael Cohen, Richard Gates, and Roger Stone. Uh, the redaction box. I'll show you on the graphic. It looks like about two words. So that's what I put in. Why I put in two unks for it. Um, it continues on with another redaction right after it, so I couldn't continue the sentence without cheating. So I, um, uh, or not even cheating, I just couldn't. So, um, uh, so this is all I could give it. So this bidirectional encoder is going to come from both sides. It's going to read Roger Stone. It's going to read uh, Richard Gates. What do you think it's going to come up in the, in the sandwich in the middle? <laughs> okay, we've got one guess. Anybody else? Kushner. That's a good one. <laughs> that's another really good one. I'll give you a hint. Um, 
Uh, but in Google News, these people have been in Google News. So the, 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 Burt knows about them. It knows that they're lawyers. It knows that they are, uh, that they've been associated with the, the president. They know that they've been associated with an investigation into the president. Uh, so this is all the stuff that, uh, that they, it knows about this person. What's the vanilla person that might be there? I'll give you a hint. It may not actually be a real person. Um, it's, uh, if, it, if it worked well, it should be David Bernstein. Um, and the other times, I've, yep, there it is. Great. So David Bernstein, turns out, is multiple people. Uh, it's a person, uh, there are several famous people. One is a, a law professor at, um, he's actually the chairman of the, of the law department, a, a major law school in the Northeast. Um, uh, also the, the chairman of the board and president of, um, a blue, of Red Cross in, um, in, in the UK, in the United Kingdom, um, is uh, named David Bernstein as well. That David Bernstein, um, how, would he, how would he be associated with uh, this sort of sentence about Cohen and the others? Well, um, unless the, that, that professor that uh, had taught Cohen and the others, there's probably no connection there. But this guy has a very direct connection. Um, he could have been in this sentence if, if he was involved, uh, as uh, most past Red Cross chiefs have been, in the intelligence investigations going on in the United Kingdom. It turns out the Red Cross is a great, as, you, as we know from um, uh, the capturing of Osama, uh, uh, the Red Cross often acts as the international arm of intelligence organizations. So um, uh, the, even though they, of course, are uh, supposed to be completely uh, non-combatant. Um, so, uh, so that's how he might have gotten involved. It was the British intelligence organization who triggered the, uh, the investigation to Trump and Putin. So um, it very well could be that David Bernstein is a reasonable guess of an average name that might have been in the document. Of course, we'll never know. But this is, this is the best it could do. Uh, I'll give you some other examples of how it did much poorly. It's really hard. The only way, um, as you can imagine, the, these are intention. I'll give you, I'll give you some that does well on that uh, were redactions that I did, similar to the, the one about the dropped wallet. We can give it, um, we can give it one like this one, where we. Um, Hopefully you can't read that text so you can all know the answer. But um, here's another one. So the IRA, blank, blank, social media accounts and interest groups, to, so dis discord in the US political system through uh, what it termed information warfare. Okay, the winner, of the, if you get this right, if you get either of these words right, and if you get more of them right than somebody else, um, you win. You can call out your answer and I'll, 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 it'll be on the honor system if you get it right. So, because uh, I, I can't possibly uh, record all this. Uh, so. Um, uh, go ahead. Good. Anybody else? Very many. Keep, just uh, yell. You got. You got. Okay, great. You ready? Go ahead and yell them out before I hit return. Otherwise, you don't even have a chance. Just yell out something. I, I should. It's uh. It should be um. It is the IRA. Uh, used, used. Did anybody have used in their um, in their in their estimate of what this should be? You, you, you said use multiple. Awesome, you win. I don't, can can the hosts win? <laughs> awesome. Let's do another one. Just uh, since you're being generous. Um, uh, so later used was the correct one. Since this, was a, since this was my redaction, I know what the answer is. This one is uh, the campaign, unk, unk, a generalized program designed in 2014 and 2015 to undermine the US electoral system to a targeted operation that by early 2016 favored candidate Trump and disparaged candidate Clinton. Uh, this is a real sentence, real, uh, an, uh, an unreal redaction, a fake redaction. What do you think the words might be there? Was what? Was a. That's a good one. As you can see, Bert's clever. It tries to pick the most likely word. And even if it's in two positions, it'll put it in both positions, even if it doesn't make sense. It, it's just trying to win the game just like you are. Let's see how you guys did against Bert. Awesome. Any more? Three, two, one. Okay off it's going to try you can see this takes a long time to even do inference on those do those 100 million uh, uh, multiplications on a cpu the answer is developed i mean bert thinks it's developed from 
Um, and it is actually, let me see, is that the truth? Let me see what the, the truth was. Developed from the campaign evolved from. So it got one of the words right. Uh, so, so so far it's 50%. It's got it's batting 500. Pretty awesome. So this is what Bert was trained on. It was trained on a single word and double word and triple word redactions. Um, and so it's pretty good at it, even without having ever read the Mueller report. It wasn't out at the time that Bert was trained. Um, so that's what we're that's where we're going to take it to the next level. It's only able to bring in outside information. It's not able to bring the information out from the document itself. It didn't learn the logic of what Muller was trying to write. It's called fine tuning. When you take a model, it's also called transfer learning. When you take a model from the outside world, um, trained on something else and apply it to a new problem. Um, transfer learning is when you take that last layer, what's called the embedding. So I'll, I'll get to the, does anybody wanna do any more of these or should, should we move on? I've got, one, I've got one head nod, so that's enough for me. I enjoy them. There's some really interesting stuff in the report, if you ever want to read it. Stuff about like the IRA. I had no idea. The IRA were, were, were very much at the forefront of this hacking operation. Uh, the IRA's operation unlocked the purchase of political advertisements on social media in the names of US persons and entities, as well as the staging of political rallies in, inside the United States. So um, that's, uh, any guesses there? You got two seconds? Three, two, one, there it is. Also included is, let's see if that's correct. Uh, the operation also included, it got 100% on that one. In general, when I was doing these two word redactions, as long as I chose words that weren't names or dates or uh, what's, what's called, those are just so you know, those are called named entities. Any noun that has uh, a particular identity. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a thing that's very specific. You're talking about a particular person or a particular point in time. Those are called named entity recognition, named entities. And when you have a natural language processing pipeline that tries to label the things in a document that are named entities, it's called named entity re recognition. And that's the, the last, imagine we're getting running out of time. How are we doing on time, Jay? Okay, well, you, are, you, are, you already, oh, did, did, anybody, did anybody get that one right? It, yeah. <laughs> uh, We'll try one more so somebody can beat Jay. Jay is, Jay is good at this, almost as good as Bert. Uh, let's see, all right, one more. Uh, actually, I'm running out. I'll just pick one from, hey, this will be interesting. I'm gonna put um, parentheses after Donald Trump and let it guess what goes there. Oops, unfortunately it's, um, it didn't, I had some new lines in between it, so it's not gonna, it didn't get all the, oh. Come on, you can do it. Okay, so uh, the presidential campaign of Donald J. Trump, parentheses, blank, blank, or campaign, uh, close parentheses, showed interest in WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks is, apostrophe S, releases of documents and welcomed their potential damage. I won't go on. So any guesses? Come on, last chance to beat Jay. Individual one, so, oh yeah, that's a really good one. Person one, cool. You can do better than that though, come on. Donald J. Trump. What else is he besides, what else is the name Trump? He's president, obviously. But what else is he as an entity? He actually has legal rights as something else other than a person. <laughs> uh, come on. <laughs> come on, guys. We're trying to, 
trying to win a book here. Citizen, okay, that, that, those are all good. They, that's still a person, still person. Those still person, those are all people. There's, there's another kind of entity, another noun, another still person. Those are titles, positions, whatever. But yeah, you're, you're on the right track, but uh, it's something else. Good, good to choose a vanilla words like the. That's a really good idea. Uh, Bert thinks it's um, comma or. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it tried to get... <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the truth is, uh, I think it was the Trump campaign. Somebody said campaign. Oh, we had two people. Did anybody say Trump campaign? Oh, you're, you're too close to the screen. You, get, you can read the small text. So... You said you said the whole thing. Did you? Okay. Uh, honorable mention. I'll sign it for you later. Okay. Um, enough fun. Let's see if the uh, the other model has trained. It's it's a bit more fun to play with actually because it can generate whole sentences without um, and it, it'll it'll write them in the style of uh, Robert Mueller. Um, let's see how that went. Um. So we can generate, this is another function that will then generate text using that model. We give it a starting string. So first as part of a full and thorough investigation of the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential campaign, the special counsel was authorized to investigate. Michael Kohler, again, this is that same one where we had uh, David Bernstein before. We wanted to compare to see which one did better and, and what they, and keep in mind now, um, you, can, you can continue to play that game in your, in your mind. If, if you ever want to learn something well, uh, create a competition like this for yourself. Uh, try to guess what the output of an algorithm is going to be before it does it. When you're writing line, when you're as coders, as developers of Python, try to guess as you're writing that line on the, on the Python console. Try to guess what it's going to output before it does. That will teach your brain how to uh, do prediction on how your code's going to run. You'll learn how to read code. So anyway, uh, we're going to do that on this particular string. Um, and, and see what name it comes out with. Any guesses about what this model does? Keep in mind, this model doesn't have access to all that Google News. All it knows is what's in the report. And these redacted names, of course, have probably been redacted everywhere in the document. So there's probably 0% chance it'll ever get it right, unless they made a mistake in their redaction. But what do you think it would have guessed? It has to be a name that's in the document, and it, or it doesn't have to be a name, it could be anything. But it has to be a word that's in the document, and it has to be a word that, um, uh, that is not one of the others in this sequence, because it would know that if you, you wouldn't say the same word twice in a sequence like this with commas between it. So that's, that, those are your criterion. What would you guess? Oh, got a couple good guess, guesses. Anybody else? Uh, oh, that's right. I need to adjust some things. It's going to probably say something, ooh, no. Uh-oh. You don't have any clue what that might be, um, Al, do you? Right, run what? Yeah, I'll have to look back and see what, what cells haven't been run. You're exactly right. I'll run everyone but the training one. Here it is. You found it. Thank you. Woohoo! Lifesaver. Okay. First, as part of their investigation of Russia's efforts, let's scroll right. Come on. Sorry for this awkward demonstration. Here we go. Michael Cullen, Richard Gates, Kislyak Alazenesis. Uh, Apparently, that's, Kislyak was a, a person in the um, in the document. Don't know I'm, that name doesn't look familiar to me. Um, I have no idea what that is, but it could be. It could be a name in there because it's a character-based model. It can make up names. So, cool. So he thinks that the Russian diplomat might have had some interaction with Michael Cullen and Richard Gates. This, this very simple single layer, and we talked about 100 million weights in the other model. This one has far fewer than that. I think it's on the order of a few thousand. So uh, this model is so much dumber, but it can still come up with reasonable answers. 
This is the power of NLP, and you can apply it to, uh, to your life as well. And, um, and if you want to apply it to, um, we'll wrap things up. If you want to apply it to uh, pro-social sort of applications, then I will be happy to mentor you um, for 30 minutes a week or every two weeks. I do this for, for several other friends here in Portland, and I'll be happy to help with you, help you work on that project. I'll help, I'll, I'll give you a head start on the things that I've learned about some of these models and, and how you can use them for good. Um, and, and if you are, as, as Al mentioned, if you have interest in this sort of thing for, um, for on a professional level, for companies that have a need, for instance, we're trying to summarize very long, lengthy technical documents, very much like the Mueller report, full of technical, but much, much more technical, in this case, uh, clinical medical records. So if you have an interest in that sort of thing, um, we have contracts for those, uh, Manseps has contracts for those sorts of uh, activities and, and he's hiring, as you heard. Uh, so uh, that's it. Um, if, uh, like I said, I'm happy to help you uh, go out into the world, build machines that assist rather than manipulate humans, um, and I will be your, um, your resource and um, whatever you need. I have GPUs, I have, um, of course, my, my um, understanding and interest in NLP. Sorry. Oh, yeah, go, sure, go ahead. Questions? Where would uh, where would you learn about intelligence augmentation? That that sounds pretty cool, but we only got about thirty seconds from you on it. Oh, no worries. It's um I actually don't know a whole lot about it myself, except to say that. It's not automating. Um, it's, I know what it's not. It's not going in and automating uh, somebody's job. It's helping them do their job better. So when you, when you replace them with some machine that's doing their job, you have them learn from that machine in order to do their job better. So um, I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, Google is the one who came, uh, or, or several um, researchers at Google Brain and other places came up with this uh, concept. Uh, but um, you can think of it uh, as an autopilot on an airplane. So. Um, uh, this is a really good example, actually. The Boeing 747 was, was built with uh, too much automation. It was built with too much AI. Uh, not 747, whatever that one that kept crashing. Uh, 737 MAX. So the MAX, exactly. Um, that, that, that plane uh, was not able to deal with a single sensor failure because it was relying on that sensor to decide whether or not to overrule what the pilot was telling the plane to do. It made it impossible for the pilots to actually save the airplane by pulling against them on the yoke. Uh, the, the machine committed suicide for all those people on that plane. And that's the sort of situation that, I, that I'm uh, passionate about trying to avoid. Um, it was, of course, out of stupidity by, by Boeing and their, their bureaucracy that they would allow that to happen, their trust in the machines rather than humans. But, that, um, but that's happening across the, around the world in all sorts of industries and all sorts of areas. So the idea would there would be, instead of uh, pulling on the yoke, uh, flash a warning light, say, uh, wake up, pilot, you're, you're, you're in a nosedive, or uh, oh, possible, possible sensor warning of stall, or whatever it was that, it, that the sensor was telling them. Give, give them some information. Try to figure out a way to get that information in their brain. And uh, there may be people who don't think that this is a good idea, but um, uh, a direct brain machine interface, uh, it's coming whether we like it or not. And so you can actually, you can actually communicate to that, uh, uh, give them that thought. Hey, pay attention to this, this gauge, look over here. Whatever it is, um, you could actually transmit that thought to their brain um, in the very near future. Um, all, the big, all the big corporations are working on that. Um, just make sure that it's, it's pro-social assistive thoughts that you're putting into people's brains, not manipulative thoughts whether it's using natural language processing or direct brain stimulation. Um, do you use uh, databases at all uh, yes. in conjunction uh, with this? That's, uh, so database technology is, um, okay, artificial intelligence, there's two approaches. There's, well, in the book, you'll learn about four different ways to build a chat bot. Only one of them we've talked about today, and that's these sort of generative deep learning models, uh, machine learning approaches. 
Uh, two of the others, one of the others involves a database, uh, and actually a special kind of database called a knowledge base. So where you can learn things about the fact that people have wallets. Wallets are valuable. Wallets are carried by humans. Uh, wallets uh, are uh, mobile and separatable from humans. And sometimes humans forget about where they are. And sometimes, you know, all these sort of facts about the world. Um, that's, uh, that's called a knowledge base when you have uh, these triplets of, uh, of uh, uh, subject, verb, noun, uh, a noun, verb, noun. Those, and those relationships um, can then be, you can do logical inference on that knowledge graph. You can use natural language processing to extract that information from a body of text, like the encyclopedia, like Wikipedia, like, um, like the Mueller report. So that would be the next step. If you really want to redact the Mueller report, you need to bring in some of these old school techniques for information extraction and use those to populate its brain with more deep logic. Rather than relying on it to figure out all the logic on its own, um, the humans can bring, that's along the lines of a, uh, uh, intelligent assistance, uh, humans are really good at figuring out what's important in life, um, what, what, what they need to remember. So there's no reason why we can't build that into a database schema, a knowledge-based schema, and have the machine get that information and then use that information to make inferences on in a document like this. So that's a very good question. So in terms of using NLP for not social positive, can you use NLP to fight against the non-social, like using it to detect fake news and, and other content? Uh, is that what you're asking what it can be used for in a pro-social way? Yes, detecting fake news, uh, generating true and actual uh, summaries of things, we're, we're all uh, overwhelmed with information overload. And, it, and, it's, and most of it is fake. Uh, most of it is designed to manipulate us. And so being able to filter that out would be one of the most important things you could do. Anything you can do to uh, assist us in competing with the machines. Uh, when, when the machines do rise up and become our overlords, it's going to be really important for us to have all of them uh, have, ability, have abilities very comparable to theirs in terms of being able to, to resist their influence. Um, so, so that's a really good one. Um, I'm trying to think of others. Um, just building a search engine. Just building a really good search engine. If you, if you want to go old school on it, um, yeah, to compete, um, do, it, do a search engine on your life, your journals, your hard drive. You know, uh, Google Desktop was a wonderful tool. The only problem was they weren't able to insert advertisements into it. That's why they killed it. You need to rebuild it for yourself if you want to have it happen or help others who are building it. There, there, are, there are open source tools that do that for you. Search the things that matter to you. Don't search the things that matter to others. Um, also, um, uh, yeah, uh, so search engine, anything that uh, affects the information that's coming into your brain and affecting your behavior, think about how that is being manipulated by others and how you can... Um, have those machines do things that you want to do. Use your will, your free will, to choose what is going into your brain. To, to, to make, we can become whoever we want to be. We can become the, the most Genghis Khan if we want to, or we can become, um, you know, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. We can become whoever we want to be if we, if we can control the information that's coming into us and training our brains. Any other questions? All right, let's hear it for Hobson and Al.